name is Kelly Voss. I'm a fourth year PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, and I am extremely fortunate to be able to study octopuses. And uh, let's see. Okay, while we're working, technical difficulties. All right, so whenever I have a conversation with anybody about octopuses, this is the first thing that comes up. So exactly how do you say more than one octopus? I like to say that scientists, we use octopuses in scientific literature, but if you're trying to make a pun, uh, octopi is going to be the way to go. But uh, if you're really pedantic, octopus is actually a Greek root word. So you can actually say octopodes, or yeah, right. if you're trying to be really yeah. uh, accurate there. But uh, for this talk, we're just going to use octopuses. Yeah, sweet. So um, octopuses are a really important organism in our local ecosystem. They're consumed by a really wide variety of predators. Lots of flat fishes, like the sarcastic fringe head with those big mouths that open that flare up really big. Um, marine mammals, even other octopuses. And in turn, octopuses eat a whole lot of uh, gastropods like snails and limpets, uh, crustaceans like crabs and shrimp um, and lobster, and bivalves like clams and mussels, which in turn, you know, eat all of the uh, algae in the system. But the octopus we're focusing on today is the California two-spot octopus, or octopus thymaculatus. Uh, it's named for these eye spots that you can see, like here are the eyes right here, but you see this blue spot right here? There's a blue circle on each side of its head. Those are called ocelli, or uh, eye spots. But, ah, this works now. Um, they live really close to the shore. I usually catch them above 30 feet deep, so they're pretty shallow for um, marine dwellers. They, like I said, they eat all kinds of marine invertebrates, other octopuses, and even fishes sometimes. And they have eight arms, not tentacles. I'll tell you the difference between the tentacles and arms in a second. But they can actually lose and regrow those arms, and that is what interests me. And there are a lot of different reasons why an octopus could lose an arm. They use their arms for a variety of tasks. So in this case, exploration, locomotion. Uh, occasionally, this is the uh, mimic octopus. They can mimic a bunch of different marine species. This one's mimicking a sea snake, and that looks like a sea snake. But you can see in each of these cases, they're using a particular set of arms. They can't necessarily use all of their arms for the same tasks. And this uh, difference in exposure can lead to uh, some risky, it's kind of risky behavior, so that can lead to some arm loss. So you see these giant arm here, giant arm here, but then you see this tiny little arm right here. That arm had been bitten off and was regrowing uh, at the time that this octopus was preserved in museum collections. And you can see again, there's the big, 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 and then this tiny little silly hair arm <laughs> growing off of the very tip. So. The more I've learned about octopuses in my career, I've wondered what happens when they lose their arms? Is it really a big deal in their lives? It's a really common occurrence. So is it like devastating when they lose an arm? Are they really put out? Or is it just a flesh wound? <laughs> so this is kind of the broad scope of my PhD. Um, I'm interested in how octopuses lose their arms and how they compensate for that arm once it's lost and while it's regrowing. Um, I've been looking at which arms they might be losing most commonly, what might influence them to lose their arms, what actually happens when they have self-defense behavior. That is an octopus arm coming out of the mouth of a moray eel, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And uh, again, how octopuses compensate for losing that arm. So we're just going to talk about one of my projects today. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about arms. Um, so I mentioned earlier that 
there's a difference between an arm and a tentacle. An arm has suckers all the way down, and it's used for all kinds of things, exploration, locomotion, food manipulation, that kind of thing. Tentacles are only for grabbing food and putting it in their mouth. So that's why anemones have tentacles, because it grabs food, puts it in his mouth. Squid have tentacles that are special, that just shoot out and grab food, pull it to their mouths. Octopuses use all of their arms for multiple things. So um, when I'm looking at an octopus, this is what I see. I see this is the head right here. So I see the head. And then the arms are labeled from anterior end, kind of the front end of the octopus, to the back end of the octopus. So there's a left side and a right side, and arm pairs one, two, three, and four. Today I'm mostly going to talk about anterior arms, so these front four arms, and posterior arms, which are the back four. And uh, the way you can tell the difference between males and females, males on this third right arm, the tip has a specialized groove that kind of looks like a little spoon um, that they use for reproduction. So they, they pass the sperm in, to the female using that little scoop. But females, all of their arms look exactly the same. So if I were to look on this octopus, I'd count one, two, three, this third right arm, and it it ended, this is a female, it ended in just the regular, regular arm tip. And uh, I'm interested in self-defense behaviors because we know a lot about how octopuses camouflage themselves. We know of that they, they're really good at escaping too, so this is me underwater with a big ink cloud that an octopus, <laughs> the octopus that's in this bag just uh, exuded. And they're very good at squeezing into really small spaces, right? But when they're like under attack and it's time to fight, we don't actually know. Science does not know. We've not quantified what it is they're actually doing. We've seen it before, but no one's ever done any experiments. So that is the question I'm trying to answer. Uh, first, let me show you how I catch an octopus underwater. Uh, Nikki here is my summer intern from UCLA. And we've, I've been making her go in the water with me every single day to go look for octopuses. So uh, what we do is we go underwater and we take you, what's very important is these dive lights. We look in every single crack and crevice all over all of the reefs that are all outside there. And once we find one, uh, Nikki's job was hold the bag <laughs> next to the, it, it's actually a pretty important job because sometimes they wiggle around you. Uh, my job was to take these big syringes full of Acetic acid, which is just distilled white vinegar, it's basically a stink bomb. So we inject some uh, some vinegar inside the hole. The octopus is like, oh, I'm out of here, and jumps out of the hole, and we just gently guide it into the net. And so this is about what that looks like. Um, this is actually us releasing an octopus later, but um, here's our little octopus friend. So cute. So cute, I know. <laughs> They're my favorite animal, can you tell? Uh, so then, <laughs> it's not it's not the bad, it's not the bad. So I'll remind you that octopuses go through this very regularly. They live in these rock crevices with these moray eels. Often when you try and catch one of these, this is there's a moray eel like less than five feet away just watching. So um, what I do after I collect them is I bring them back to the lab and I place them in a tank together and we have a GoPro array, one in, one in front to get a lateral view and one on top to get an overhead view. And I just allow them to interact for an hour, don't intervene. We, Nikki and I sit off to the side and wait for an hour and then come back and you'll be happy to know every single one of the octopuses has survived these encounters. Don't stress. <laughs> um, and the mores were all caught this summer out in the cove as well as um, the octopuses. So I'm looking for how long the octopus takes to move, how long it spends moving around the tank, which arms it's using, and what it's doing with those arms. And um, I'll introduce a term to you called autonomy. So is everyone familiar with, come on in. Um, is everyone familiar with how lizards lose their tails? So their, their tail will drop off at a specified breakage point and it'll kind of fall and just wriggle around. Um, with octopuses, octopuses technically can do that too, but there's no breakage point. So we're, it's a little more mysterious how they do that. 
But what's interesting about octopus arms is that they're programmed with, um, it's called a behavioral, like a rudimentary behavioral circuit. So the arm can actually do behaviors if it is removed from the body. So if the arm, if the, if the octopus drops the arm, it's a decoy, but it's a really interesting decoy because it'll wrap itself around the moray's face. It'll grab onto rocks on the side of the aquarium. It's very um, active for a couple of hours. So that's what I'm looking for. And this is the more dramatic version of what I thought was going to happen. And these things like, oh no, we're going to, these poor octopuses are going to get nailed. But this is mostly what I've actually seen. Um, the octopuses are pretty clever. They're very good at inking. Again, this is, you see our little eye spot here. Here's the moray. Like, oh, where's the octopus? And the octopus is like, I don't think so, buddy. Um, but don't worry, we have fresh water running through. Uh, the tanks at all times just to keep the water circulating so we can see and so the more I can breathe because actually the reason one of the reasons octopus is ink it's a good smoke screen but also um, the ink physically it coats the sensory organs it coats the olfactory organs so the eel can't smell and it can also coat the gills so they can't, they can't cough um, so it's a really good deterrent as well as a uh, smoke screen uh, for the octopuses to get away. Um, but we want the water to circulate because also it can get in the octopus's scales and that's not good for it's not good for anybody. Another thing I've been seeing that's really interesting, this is what I was looking for um, that I thought was gonna happen was this this is an octopus. I was kind of staying out of the way we try and hide because octopuses have really good vision. I don't want more than one predator like staring at it while it's trying to while I'm trying to get data. But um, this octopus is just sitting in the tank. Here comes the moray. But it sticks one arm out. It sticks one arm out like, hey, you can, maybe you, you can just want this one and then I'll just go this way. You can just have this arm. Um, so we've seen a few incidences of that. It's also interesting to me because um, this octopus is a male. And so its specialized arm is right here behind it. And it's extending its, that L2, the, the arm that's across the body from it toward the more so I'm my interest is in whether it's using a particular arm to be that distraction and I think in males that that distraction arm is the one that's the farthest away from uh, that specialized reproductive arm and now the moment you've all been waiting for what happens in my trials this is what happens when an actual uh, actual interaction so notice me very oblivious in my corner over here. Uh, it happens as fast as that. Um, that's about as bad as any of the attacks that I've gotten this summer have been. Uh, just a little bite. Um, in lab, we've gotten an Amore to actually pull the whole arm off and the arm wraps around the rostrum and grabs the walls of the tank. Um, but again, we're looking at this octopus. This is its underside. This is one of its front arms. So I, my hypothesis was that the mori was attacked, that the arms, the front arms, those anterior arms I was talking about, would be attacked more, and that's what I've been seeing so far in these videos. So that's been really interesting to me. Uh, do you want to? Know that? <laughs> yeah. Is that its special yeah. arm that's up on the side? Um, not exactly. It's, it's still one of the front arms, but it's not really reaching toward. <clears throat> The moray, it's uh, kind of just reaching up into the corner. That's kind of a octopus is have a habit of doing that. You can see kind of right here. There's now a little bit of a, a little bit of an injury there on the webbing, but it didn't pull the whole arm off. Um, so hopefully, um, you've learned something today. We've learned that octopuses are an important part of the Catalina ecosystem. Um, a lot of, they're eaten by a lot of things, and as you can see, you, you can imagine like, the octopuses aren't necessarily getting fully eaten. Sometimes they're contributing to the food web just by losing an arm or two. So sublethal predation is also another fascinating topic to me. Um, and when they do lose those arms, they grow back, which is really cool. Um, and it's a really cool adaptation for an invertebrate because it's so small and squishy, there's only so many things it can do to protect itself from being eaten. So uh, that's a really interesting mechanism that not all animals have. And 
judging from the survivorship of my experiments this summer, Octopus is still pretty good self-defense. So with that, I'd like to thank a boatload of people. Um, but I've, I've just I've been all over the place. I'm like I said, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Santa Cruz, so I've been traveling a lot and working with a lot of really wonderful people. Um, I'd especially like to thank uh, Lauren and Kelly uh, from Wrigley here because they've been helping me be a good marine biologist since 2012. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank uh, the RUs that have worked under me diving this summer and Maurice Roper for taking photos and Dr. and Maurice for tolerating me this summer. <laughs> and if you want to learn more, uh, you can visit my website, kelloboss.com. <laughs> or you can go ahead and ask me a question right now. This is me with a preserved giant Pacific octopus in uh, the, at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And it's the biggest preserved octopus I've ever seen. It was probably 50 pounds preserved, which means it was a lot bigger when it was. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Yeah. Uh, what is the rate of growth typically for an arm, say like it's four feet long, how long would it take to regrow? Sure, so it, um, it, it's not, it all depends on how much they're eating, so completely food dependent. So with a smallish octopus like Bimaculatus, if it lost an arm, it probably takes about two months if they could just eat whatever they want, however much they want, so about two months. How big do these ones locally here get? Um, so the biggest bimaculatus I've ever seen probably had a head like this and arms like that. So really not very large. They're mostly a lot smaller. What can they do to hurt you? Um, so I've been bitten by one one time. It was totally my fault because in 2014 I was here with uh, Dr. Jenny Hoffmeister. Uh, tracking octopuses and so we had to insert a tracker into it and my fingers were kind of inside its mantle and it bit me on the finger and it was it was my fault I had it coming. <laughs> so they have like a, a beak? Under yeah they do, have, they do have a beak it kind of looks like a hawk's bill but upside down like a hawk's bill with an underbite almost um, and they it's kind of a Swiss army mouth like they use it for you know, shipping away at shells and then they also have a tongue, a special drilling rasping tongue called a radula that all mollusks have. Um, and they use that radula in conjunction with um, the special acidic venomous uh, saliva that they use to, to break down shell, but it also kind of stings when they bite you because it's also a little bit venomous. Um, so they use it to drill a hole in shells or in a crab's carapace or something, and then it kills the animal in the so what do they eat here locally? Is it the abalone shells that they go after? They do or? heavily predate upon abalone. Um, Dr. Hoffmeister is working with Calfish and Wildlife um, and the, the crew that the whole crew up and down the state that's trying to save the white abalone because it's really hard to put new recruits in the water and not let them all get eaten by octopuses. So they'll eat any anything that's basically anything with a shell, honestly, like snails, limpets, abalone, crab, shrimp, uh, clams, mussels, they're really, really generalist predators. They'll eat, really, um, other than, you know, algae, they, they, they're carnivores. Yeah. When you capture these octopuses, uh, does it recognize you as a predator and use its defense, or does it not, if this is something new for it? Um, it definitely, so when you try and go into their den space, they will push, they'll kind of punch out. Like they, they'll, sometimes they'll grab the syringe and I've had a couple of, I've lost a couple of syringes because they'll <laughs> yank it into the hole and not let go. And they're, those suckers, they're individually controlled and they're super strong. Um, so there's that. But once you convince them out, they're just trying to escape. Really? Yeah, they defend themselves when they're kind of, when there's no escape. Yeah. And so, yeah. one other, do they come out at night? You know, they they do come out at night, but they actually, my study in 2014 when I was tracking the octopuses, they are active at this, with the same proportion all day and all night. So we, we previously thought that they had some diel behaviors, so they're more active at dawn and dusk. But from our study, we, we tracked 10 octopuses and they were all active or not 
all day long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, other than all the tools they're equipped with in their anatomy, do they ever use external tools? These ones I've never seen tool use, but um, we've seen examples of the coconut octopus or the veined octopus, right? The YouTube is amazing. You can see wonderful octopus videos like all day long. Like <laughs> that's not what I do in my office. <laughs> um, so so they, they'll pick up two halves of a coconut and they can roll away or hold onto stuff. So a lot of a lot of their tool use involves um, shelters. But like in aquariums, so, some aquarium trained their octopus to press a button and take photos of the aquarium guests. It was bizarre. Um, so octopus are pretty intelligent and they're trainable. Um, but we have we have few examples of tool use. They theoretically can, but maybe, but maybe not. What are they using to do the escape? I had one, you know, like it shoots backwards away from you. Is that yeah. just its leg function or is it shooting water through? Actually, it's shooting water through. So um, there's a special organ called a siphon. And when they breathe in, their heads kind of swell. And then they breathe out, their, their mantle contracts. But the water shoots through kind of a funnel on the back underside of that mantle. So it's like right here. Um, and they can use that. They, it, since it's totally muscle, they can point it in, in any direction, and that's how they have directionality while they swim. That's also how they squirt you with ink um, or with water. I've had the misfortune of being squirted with both. Lost a lot of shirts that way. Um, but uh, yeah, they they use that. They use the siphon for jet propulsion. Any other question? Since you've had the opportunity to interact with so many octopuses, do you have any favorite experiences or things you've noticed about their behavior? Um, so I worked with giant Pacific octopuses for my master's degree, and those are that's don't tell the others that's kind of my favorite species. They're really fun. Um, they're a little bit longer lived. The Bimaculatus lives like one to two years, but uh, giant Pacifics live like three to five, and they're really personable. Um, I like them. I enjoy them. Uh, I had one little friend of me named Gemini who uh, liked to shoot me in the face with her siphon water in front of my undergrads during class. Like she arc, it's like an inch thick, like arc of water out of the tank and just on top of my head, just drenching me. And mind you, this was in Alaska in like December and January, so um, really rude. Did not appreciate that. Um, but another thing I noticed about octopuses and like that kind of got me interested in self-defense behavior, is everybody kind of had a move. One octopus had um, like an urchin in her tank, and whenever I, like I was showing them video of different things that they would see in the wild, and when the video of the sea lion came around, she would come up and hug the urchin, and be like, no, you can't bite me, you're gonna get a mouthful of urchin, like, you don't want this. <laughs> and then Jen and I, the, the squirty one, um, she would do a poop, at things she didn't like. like the, the, so she would just poop a big, long poop at, at anything she didn't like, including the nature show host that um, we, we released her uh, on video underwater, and she kind of pooped in his face. Um, <laughs> so lots of quirky behaviors, lots of interesting things that are hard to quantify because not every one of them does it, but like everybody's got a little personality going on. So I just... I don't know. I just love them. I just, I just love the little things that they do that I find that they do. Yeah. I know she had a little airspace on the top of the tank. Did the octopus ever retreat into the airspace? No. They, they kind of, especially these ones that, they, these ones have really, they're not really domesticated at all. They haven't really been fed by us. They just came out of the ocean. So once they hit air, they're like, oh, no, this is wrong. But uh, the giant Pacific octopuses, if you keep them in captivity for a little while, they're like, oh, air's not so bad. And <laughs> like, try and get out sometimes. Um, how long can they stay in the air? Oh, for a few minutes. So um, the one picture I had before where when we were looking at the arms, uh, it's just kind of flat out on a piece of wet plastic. Um, I, keep, I can keep them out of water for a couple minutes to do external measurements. I look at their um, body size by looking at how big their mantle is, how far apart their eyes are, and sometimes I measure their arms or I, I look at their arms to see if any of them have been injured previously. Um, but, I mean, you don't want to leave them out too long, but they have a nice mucus coating on their skin that keeps them moist for a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I missed the first part of your lecture, but um, is the population locally, is it diminishing, or is the, down to all the preserves, is it coming back? 
Um, so octopuses in general, when we're doing octopus population surveys, they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, in certain areas, slightly warming waters has actually been better for the populations, but in other places it's been worse. So it's kind of transitioning here. Um, so it's really hard to survey octopus populations, right? Because they're very good at hiding. So yeah, that's really good. <laughs> they're certainly not endangered. But I think the most recent study I heard of uh, looking at octopus populations was uh, Seattle Fish and Game, or Washington Fish and Game went out in Puget Sound in Seattle to look at the giant Pacific octopus population just to like check, and they seem to be doing pretty well. So um, I think they're okay right now, but it's honestly hard to tell. But we, we found upwards of 30 octopuses this summer within six oh, okay. weeks, which is pretty decent. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think they're doing okay. We, we, see, we see one pretty much every day when we go out. Yeah. Okay. Is there any commercial fishing for octopus anywhere in the world? Oh, huge in Japan, humongous. So giant Pacific octopus <laughs> range all around uh, the Pacific Rim from Japan up around into the Arctic Circle and back down to Point Conception. Um, so we don't really have one in the U.S. And not really in in Canada either. Japan is humongous. Also, octopus vulgaris, uh, the common octopus, is a really big uh, food source in Europe. So the Mediterranean fishery is quite large. Um, but they're talking about maybe like I heard a rumor that uh, someone was interested in opening a, a octopus bimaculatus or bimaculatus, whatever they can get um, fishery down here, but. I mean, that's kind of, how I don't do know they, how they would catch them in large numbers. Large how, do numbers they commercially, numbers how do they commercially catch them? Um, so octopuses most commonly come up in shrimp pots, because you, you stand down a shrimp pot, it gets filled with shrimp, and the octopus is like, sweet, <laughs> and jumps on it. Um, in Alaska, you'll set down, send down a shrimp pot and just bring up like 75 pounds of octopus, because it just ate all your shrimp. I'm just sitting there all that happy. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, usually the octopus that we pull up around here is by catch from shrimp pots. Yeah. You ever eat octopus? I have eaten octopus twice in my life. Once was like a little like pickled uh, octopus, little baby octopus from like a Chinese restaurant, and then the other time I was in Japan for a conference and had a little octopus sashimi. I don't personally like it because it's really tough. You have to like beat yeah. the living daylights out of it and marinate it. Like it's too much work. I'd rather eat calamari, eat all the squid, don't eat the <laughs> 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 